Please arise. The word of the Lord chosen for service this morning, for us to be enlightened by, is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Please be seated. We pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Well, you go to the mailbox one day, and you open it. And there inside is a beautifully embossed envelope, and it's thick, and it's heavy, and you wonder, what's in there? What's inside? This looks exciting. You open it up, and it says, you're invited. It's a wedding invitation to ceremony to a reception to a feast a party who doesn't like that you're excited by the prospect everybody likes to go to a wedding wedding of their loved ones wedding of their friends and to see family to have some good food and some good drink and whatever else there is it's fun to get that invitation we have just such an invitation in the parable that is before us Jesus uses the picture of a wedding feast and the typical celebration that would go on to teach us about the end of the world. See, he says the kingdom of heaven will be like. Pretty much all of Jesus' other parables, he says the kingdom of heaven is like. Because the kingdom of heaven is going on right now, it's God's activity to save, to forgive sins. But part of that kingdom is still coming, and that's judgment day. Jesus teaches us here what all is involved. It's the invitation in the mail that tells us when it will be, tells us what we need to do to get ready for it, and what we can expect at the party. So first of all, when will it be? You get that invitation in the mail, and maybe the first thing you do is pull out your phone and check your calendar. Oh, am I free on that day? And if not, maybe I need to cancel, or maybe I need to move something around so I can make it. It depends on your priorities. Check your calendar. Well, Jesus here says something pretty different. A lot of people have different ideas about the end of the world. Some people say, well, you know, it's going to be a man that's going to bring the end on himself through global warming. Or maybe an asteroid's going to come and hit the earth. God doesn't have anything to do with it. Other people say, yeah, God's going to bring the end of the world, and I think we can figure out when it is. A few years ago, everybody thought the end of the world was going to come. Well, not everybody, some people. Because the Mayan calendar was ending. You remember that? I thought that was pretty silly because I'm sure that it only went to that date simply because they can only go so far. What's the point? There have been many Christian preachers who claim to know when the end of the world would be. Seventh-day Adventists have picked three different dates in the past that they said would be the end of the world, and it never happened. And Warren Camping, a few years ago, he picked one date, didn't happen, picked another date, didn't happen, he gave up. Many people have tried to predict the end of the world by finding some secret code, some secret message. They were all wrong, and they always will be wrong. And this is why. Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And that's reflected in the parable. The virgins, who are like bridesmaids, they go out to meet the, the bridegroom, and they know he's coming, but they don't know exactly when. And he delays, and they fall asleep. But then suddenly, the cry rings out, Here he is! Go out to meet him. It comes unexpectedly and suddenly. 
and so it will be with the end of the world. Nobody knows the day nor the hour, and it will come like a thief in the night. And when it comes, it will be obvious. We read that in our scripture reading from Thessalonians. He said that Jesus would come with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet, with a shout. Everyone will know. Everyone will see him. But will they be ready? Will you be ready? See, there is no second chances. That's what this parable shows us. Did you notice? The five foolish bride, uh, bridesmaids, the five foolish virgins who are gone when Jesus comes, they come back later. And the five wives, they're in with Jesus. They're in at the feast. They're in with the bridegroom. But the door was shut, and it did not open again. They knocked, and they said, Lord, 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 let us in, let us in. And he said, I don't know you. There are no second chances on that day. Either you're ready or you're not. And you can't get out your calendar and mark it down and say, well, I'll put it off till later. I'll get ready later. Maybe when I'm older and then maybe the thing will come. It's not going to happen now. You need to be ready all the time. It reminds me of another door that was shut. God told Noah to build an ark. He told him that he was going to destroy the whole earth with a flood because of the great sin, the great wickedness that was there. And it took Noah 120 years to build that ark. You better believe that he had a lot of opportunity to talk to people about why he was building this gigantic mammoth boat. The Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. And it also says that no one listened. I can just hear him. Stupid old Noah. Foolish old man. He's building his ark. Saying the end of the world is going to come, that's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. But the day that the rain started falling, Noah and his family were inside, and everyone else was outside. And God had shut the door. There were no second chances. And so it will be at the end of the world. The judgment will come at a day that you do not expect. It will come suddenly. And therefore, we need to be urgent about this. This needs to be a priority. This needs to be something that we think about each day. It's like the difference between a pop quiz and a test. If your teacher tells you you're going to have a test in two weeks, maybe you don't do anything for 13 days. But if your professor constantly has pop quizzes all the time, and your grade depends on it, and you don't even really know what it will be on, if you want to get a good grade, you better be studying constantly. So it is with us. We need to be ready all the time. But how? How do we get ready for that day? Now, you get that wedding invitation in the mail, and it usually tells you there's something you're supposed to do. RSVP online. Tell them whether you want chicken or fish. Maybe get a present. If you're like me, you procrastinate about those things a lot. I don't know how many times I've ended up going out to get the present between the ceremony and the reception. And maybe you forget to RSVP. But imagine, you're invited to this wedding by your close friends or your family, and you forget to do those things. You never RSVP. And you never tell them whether you want chicken or fish, and you don't get them a present. What do you think they would rather have? You out at the store missing their wedding so you can get those things, or not coming because you're ashamed that you didn't respond, or you there? They invited you because they want you there. That's what gets you ready for that wedding, not the other stuff. I mean, sure, it would have been nice if you did it, and they would have liked it if you did it. But it is their invitation that prepares you for coming to that wedding. And so it is here. Jesus is using an example from their lives. This was a ceremony that would take place. You have the whole community there for the wedding, and they would pick ten bridesmaids, ten virgins, and they would go out with their lamps and meet the bridegroom and lead him to the hall with their lamps. The five that were foolish were really foolish for two reasons. One, they didn't bring enough oil. That was foolish. But what was far more foolish is that when the cry went out, here's the bridegroom, it's time, they left. Where are they going to buy oil at midnight? And even if they do buy oil, by the time they get it and come back, obviously it's going to be too late to take part in their procession. Wouldn't it have been better if they had stayed? A lot of people look at this parable and, and they say, okay, being prepared, that means having enough oil. It, it means that I need to do certain things. 
I need to make sure I do this and this and this and this and this. I do good, some good works over here. I do bad over here. And that gets me ready. But you're overanalyzing the parable. The oil, the lamp, it's part of the story. To get across the point that Jesus is making, you need to be prepared. And if we want to see how we are prepared, there's a really great parallel between the wise and the foolish. Matthew 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter, uh, sorry, verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a man, a wise man, who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. Great was its fall. This is what it means to be wise, to be prepared. It means to hear Christ's word and do it, to take it to heart. He's talking about faith. And that's something that we can't go and buy for ourselves. It's something that we can't go out and get at the last hour. It's something that we can't take from somebody else. As the foolish virgins tried to do. To be prepared, to be wise, we need Christ to work that faith in our hearts. We needed him to prepare us for this feast by coming from heaven to earth, by bending down to be with us, to live for us, to die for us, to rise for us, to shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. To shed his blood to invite you to a feast that you don't really deserve to be at. To rise again, to forgive your sins, to prepare you who are by nature unprepared for that day. See, Jesus, by his coming, has invited you to this feast. He wants you there. And that's what prepares you. That's also why he knows you. Some people talk about the importance of knowing God. You know, you got to know God. you got to have a relationship with God. Only when they spend all their time talking about that, they're missing the most important thing. It's not you knowing God, but God knowing you. And we see that in the text. When the foolish virgins come back and knock on the door, Jesus says, I do not know you. Get out of here. But the ones who are inside, clearly, he knows them. And Jesus does know us. Paul writes in the book of Timothy, the Lord knows those who are his. And Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus knows you, not just because he made you, but because he redeemed you, because he died for you, taking your sins upon himself, because he recreated you by sending you his Holy Spirit to create faith in your heart. That, his invitation, his forgiveness, his spirit, his word, is what prepares you. And having that, you are prepared. And what joy that brings. You know, isn't it much better to be prepared for things? If you're planning a wedding, you're probably pretty stressed until you get everything done. I know every week I've got a sermon to get ready, and I like to be done with it by Thursday night. And if I'm not, I might start to get a little stressed out about it. It's so much more enjoyable to be prepared for things. And so it is with that day. Amos, in our scripture reading from the Old Testament, talked about how the day of the Lord was darkness and not light for those who are not prepared, but for we who have faith in Christ through his spirit. What a joy it is. He calls for us to look forward to that day. Uh, I remember one time I was going to my brother's house, and he has a, a daughter. She's four now. I think she was about two then. And he told us that she had said to him the night before, I can't sleep. You know, these people are coming. I'm just too excited to sleep. 
That should be our attitude towards the coming of the Lord. It should be the most urgent, the most wonderful thing for us to look forward to because we have been prepared for it. It should be joy. See, a lot of people have some strange ideas about what heaven will be like. They talk about you know, being up in the clouds and playing a harp. And it sounds, it sounds boring. But the Bible doesn't say anything of the kind about heaven. No, in fact, nearly every time that the Bible describes heaven, it describes it as a feast, a party, food and drink and fellowship and fun and laughter and light. Who doesn't like that? Everybody likes that. And this is something that the people in Jesus' day really, really could have connected with. Because this whole parable is filled with this expectant joy. See, we might look forward to a wedding and a wedding feast somewhat, but not like they did. We got lots of things that entertain us. And sometimes we're at a wedding and there's places we'd rather be. Maybe you'd, wow, I wish I was watching the football game right now and not at this wedding. But in their day, their lives were a lot more boring. And these wedding celebrations would last for a week. This would be the thing that they would look forward to for a long time. That's the image that Christ is bringing here. We should look forward to this feast of eternal life with that kind of expectant joy. I just can't wait until that day comes. I just can't wait until my Savior returns. We should lift up our heads and rejoice for our redemption is drawing near. Because heaven, that feast, greater than any of the feasts, any of the parties of this world, will not just last for seven days, but forever. And the hymn writer, Bernard, Bernard of Morlis, many hundreds of years ago, wrote about it this way. Jerusalem the golden, with milk and honey blessed, beneath thy contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed. I know not, oh, I know not, what joys await us there, what radiancy of glory, what bliss beyond compare. There is the throne of David, and there from care released, the shout of them that triumph the song of them that feast, and they who with their leader have conquered in the fight forever and forever are clad in robes of white. This is our hope. This is our expectant joy if we are prepared, and Christ Jesus prepares us. This is what we have to look forward to. It could come any time. Therefore, let us keep it at the front of our thoughts. Let us think about it when we rise up in the morning. Let us look forward to it with joy and pray with John in his revelation. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please arise.